It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jack Gilbert. He is a co-founder of the Earth Microbiome Project, the director of the Microbiome Center, and a professor of surgery at the University of Chicago. And he's also a group leader at, for microbial ecology at the Argonne National Laboratory. Dr. Gilbert has co-authored more than 300 peer-reviewed publications. He is also an author of the popular science book, Dirt is Good, The Advantage of Germs for Your Child's Developing Immune System. Dr. Gilbert's work has recently been highlighted in several programs, including those on Science Friday at NPR, NOVA on PBS. He has won numerous awards and accolades uh, for his highly disciplinary work. In 2015, he was named by Business Insider as one of the top 50 scientists changing the world, and also by Popular Science as one of the brilliant 10. His research spans from soil biology to medical microbiology to biotechnology to microbial ecology. Dr. Gilbert's work is at the forefront of developing unifying principles of how communities of microbes assemble and function in our bodies and in diverse environments ranging from college dormitories to the soil. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gilbert. Uh, thank you. I, I don't think I can um, do enough justice to uh, the, the praise that have been heaped upon this conference. Um, everyone said it's a, it's a great conference. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, I want more discourse. I want more of that communication. We should cut these talks down to 20 minutes. They get boring. Uh, but the, the opportunity for interaction with this caliber of science, scientific groups and minds and, and thinkers, for me, is just wonderful. I love the opportunity to communicate with people. Um, I am English, I apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> the British Empire wasn't a good thing, but uh, you know, we will atone for it, trust me. Um, I'm also uh, apparently a professor of surgery, which is very strange, I'm not an MD. I do not have a doctorate in that way, I have a PhD. Um, I actually trained as a butterfly specialist in the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, back about 20 years ago, and then somehow stumbled into protein chemistry, and then somehow stumbled into microbes. Uh, the most noble thing I think I've ever done was I created, or identified a protein in bacteria in Antarctica, which is now used to keep your ice cream smoother, happier, and safer, right? <laughs> Woo! Ice cream! <laughs> for, me, for me, that was the best. I love ice cream. Um, it's all been downhill since then. Uh, I like uh, what Laura said about unifying principles, right? For me, that's everything. I'm a, I'm a professor of surgery. I work in a clinical department, and about 60% of my research is on how to make humans healthier. But the one thing I've found for all of my work is that I cannot make people healthier unless the environment around them is healthy. It's just not possible. We need the combination of those two components of the healthy world around us and our healthy bodies in order to promote wellness in our society. Full stop. So, I'm going to talk about linking soil to human health. I do a lot of work in soils. For me, they're fundamental, as they are for everyone else that's spoken today and, and yesterday. Um, but for me, I view them less in the form of aggregates, less in the form of individual components, that's in the form of dirt and soil, and more in the form of a home for microbes, a home for microbial organisms. I'm going to drive the camera people crazy, because I do have a bit of ADHD, and I can't stand still. I find it next to impossible. So um, let's, see, let's see how I can. <laughs> yeah, you guys are good. I like that. This is uh, my favorite quote from my colleague Julian Davies. He goes, once the diversity of the microbial world is catalogued, it will make astronomy look like a pitiful science. Any astronomers in the audience? A few? Oh, sorry, guys. Um, there are one time sent to the 24 stars in the known universe. There are one time sent to the 30 microbes, bacteria especially on this planet. They outstrip them by almost a, a billion. Uh, that, that alone is, is fundamental, but it's the properties of those organisms the roles they play in shaping the ecosystems around us, including our own bodies, which is fundamental to our understanding of health and wellness. So, 
From my perspective, um, this started in around 2008, 2009, when we decided to try and catalogue that extraordinary diversity. So no small tasks, no small problems, we just tackle everything. Uh, we wanted to see if we could understand the microbial world by sequencing it, by looking at the genomes of the bacteria, just like the human genome. Every bacteria, every microbe has its own genome. And we went out to try and sequence them all, look at all of the microbial genomic material out there and classify it, identify it, just like Darwin did on the, on the Beagle, or like the famous 19th century explorers going out and cataloging plants and animal specimens, we wanted to do it for microbes. And we didn't just tackle soils, we tackled oceans and humans and aardvarks and, and um, everything. <laughs> we, even, we even looked at the International Space Station with the, with the prefix that, well, it's in the Earth's gravitational influence, therefore it's pretty much the Earth. Um, so we sequenced an enormous amount of material from an enormous number of places, and we identified a lot of organisms. Um, over 300,000 new species. Um, in fact, we've gone above that. We have over a million new species now, because uh, since this infographic was done, we've actually uh, quadrupled the number of samples that have been generated and processed. Um, but the, fi <laughs> the, uh, the, the major finding, and I would laugh because um, when I told my mum this finding, she was like, and you spent how much finding out that? Um, <laughs> is that the world can be divided into microbes that live with an animal or a plant and microbes that don't. Um, I know, right? Duh. Um, <laughs> So, but it, it's, it's fundamentally important to classify. Humans love putting things in boxes. We love putting things in pots. It helps us to understand the world. So, you know, if I look at free living environments, the next stage of uh, division is whether they live in a saline ecosystem or a non-saline ecosystem. And then it gets down further and further and further. And organisms find their own little niches in the world, their own little home where they can thrive and survive and be well. In hosts, it's the division between animals and plants. And then down even further than that, you can go into what parts of the animal they live in. The microbes in your intestine right now are very different to the microbes in your mouth. It's very different to the microbes on your skin. You are an ecosystem of ecosystems. And the same is true for soil. Only about 5 to 10% of soil is actually covered with microbial life. Most of it's quite barren. But that colonization, those microbes that colonize the soil on its infinitesimal level, are immensely important for the functional health of that environment. We looked at ecosystems around the world and tried to identify which ones were the most rich. And luckily for this conference, the most rich ones were the uh, soils, right? Soils and sediments. And I think I said in an earlier discussion that we can't ignore sediments. Sediments are soils waiting to be formed. Uh, most some of the richest alluvial plain materials are the, the bottom of ancient lakes and they can fuel farming for um, uh, thousands of years. And we also find that plants take up a large portion of that as well. Plant ecosystems uh, foster and select for microbes out of the soil in order to regenerate themselves. And that sounds hyperbolic, but bacteria in the soil can shape the productivity of a plant. They can shape that plant's disease resistance they can shape that plant's stress tolerance. And if you ever want to know about stress tolerance, think about water stress, think about temperature stress, think about light stress. All the stresses these plants will suffer in a changing climate, all the stresses that our crops will suffer in a changing climate, microbes can help mediate some of those relationships. Bacteria sense and select for certain microbes Sorry, plants sense and select for certain bacteria to colonize them. And those bacteria play fundamental roles in how the plant works. Uh, because I can, we spent a long time looking at vines, grape, yard, grape vines and vineyards around the world. So I traveled around the world. You know, I, I, I'm very self-sacrificing um, <laughs> uh, to, to collect soil and leaves and berries and stems from all kinds of vineyards all around the world, and I may have done some sampling along the way for other types of products. Um, and the one thing we found was if I take a Merlot grapevine, Vitis vinifera Merlot A, and I plant it in California, it will select for different types of bacteria that are only found in those Californian soils. 
If I plant the same vine in Long Island, it will select for a different group of bacteria. It, the same is true for France and New Zealand. That relationship between the soil and the plant is not universal. It's actually endemic to local areas. We need to understand that. Why are they selecting for these organisms? And how does where you plant your crop affect the productivity, the disease resistance, and the stress tolerance of that animal, of the plant? Uh, animals, plants, same thing. We're all just lumps of tissue that have come around in the last 500,000 years, and, and um, uh, microbes have colonized us, right? But that, to me, is fundamental. And I'll get into that, because biotechnology can play a very important role in helping us to mediate that effect. Natural processes are absolutely essential, but if we can unpick that lock, we can play a major significant role in helping to make those environments more sustainable and more adaptable to a changing world. One of the things we found in the Earth Microbiome Project was that there's something I like to term as microbial osmosis. For those of you who don't know what osmosis is, if you have a really salty environment, um, molecules will start to move from a highly saline environment to a non-saline environment or vice versa. We tend to move from an area where there's lots of people to an area where there's fewer people, so we can colonize that. Microbes do the same thing. Most environments contain a large amount of microbial diversity, but certain environments do not. Microbes from a very diverse environment, like those on the far right, where you've got lots of colors and lots of boxes, lots of species diversity, actually provide a reservoir for microbes that colonize areas that are harder for many organisms to live in, like deserts, like human bodies, like plants. That idea of a biodiversity reservoir that you might understand from thinking about biodiversity in terms of a rainforest is also fundamental to microbial life. And understanding where those reservoirs exist, protecting them and fostering them, has become a key and central part of what it means to be a microbial ecologist today. We also see that microbes are not all the same, right? But each one of them is uniquely adapted to the environment they find themselves in. If I look up at the top, very multicolored, almost Jackson Pollock-esque um, graph up there, each one of those vertical lines is an individual genus of bacteria. Uh, you, your genus is Homo, right? So your Homo genus, Sapien, that's your species uh, designation. Well, there are more genera of bacteria, more uh, genus of bacteria in, uh, in one microbial phylum than there are in all of the plant and animal life on Earth. The microbes are immensely diverse. But what's quite remarkable is, no matter which environment we go into, no matter which genus we select, we find that they're use, usually universally distributed. But if we go down to the strains, the subspecies, that's like the the individuals within this audience, we're all uh, different, right? We all have different capabilities and abilities. Microbes are the same. Well, they select in individual environments. There are unique species of bacteria, unique subspecies, which are very good at helping corn to survive drought tolerance, drought stress. There are others that are very good at helping your body to process certain types of nutrients. They're the same kind of bacterium, the same genus, but very different strains. And they, I love to use this example. Uh, is there anyone in the room that has never heard of the bacterium E. coli? So most people have heard of E. coli, right? It's pretty universal. It's a, it's a very common bacteria. It's found in your gut. It can poison you, right? There are, e. coli food poisoning is a real thing. But there are 800 species of E. coli, 800 strains of E. coli that we know of. And some of those strains of E. coli um, only have about 40 to 50% genetic similarity to the other ones. If I took um, Laura, for example, I'm going to pick on Laura, and I swapped out 40 or 50% of her genetic material, I could make her into a fungus, <laughs> right? That's the level of genetic diversity in one species of bacteria. And some of those will kill you. Some of them are essential for your health. Some of them help to regulate how cows produce milk. Some of them help to regulate how certain species of plant survive in a, in a temperature fluctuation, like a, a, a chill zone where you get some frost. 
That's fundamental. These microbial diversity is extraordinary. It's mind-boggling. So we have to understand that relationship. I do actually have some weird things here, like animal proximal gut and animal distal gut and animal corpus. Um, we did a large study looking at uh, what happens to people when they die. Um, this is uh, an aside, but I, my ADHD can't handle not telling you the story. Um, uh, we, when, you, when you die, your immune system switches off like that. And when it switches off, all the little microbes that have been living inside you and looking after you take over. Exactly the same as when a plant dies and it, it starts to rot down, the microbes inside it start to take over. And they start to disassemble that body. And there are people, um, you may know some of them, um, including relatives of my own, who have basically um, uh, uh, given their body to the study of what happens when you decay. So we have body farms around the United States that um, provide uh, bodies that people have donated for this purpose uh, so we can understand what happens to a body when it decays. And so we've spent a long time trying to identify how microbes invade the body after death, which is essentially immensely important for understanding biogeochemical cycling on a large global scale. And also very important for forensic applications, uh, which is a lot of stuff we do with the National Institutes of Justice. I, I, we do everything. It's, it gets really confusing. Um, so I, I, I'm using this data now to model this microbial world, to try and understand if I can predict how that microbial world will change and how the services it provides for humanity will change in a changing world. And I can do two things in that way. I can extrapolate beyond um, ability to detect, right? I can take... I can take my current observations and I can extrapolate into the rest of the world, into the rest of the time that I have available to me on this planet. Or I can predict the past. I can see what an environment was like in 100 years ago or 200 years ago and see what was the great prairie like when it was uh, growing up, right? Can I predict that system? Or I can predict the future. If the world is changing, will I be able to plant this particular crop in this field in the future if the microbial world changes? And that's going to be incredibly important as we move forward with the work that we do. So predicting or extrapolating current observations, uh, we saw some uh, maps of the world where people have used very clever math to predict how different properties of soil will change across the world. And we actually have many, many different parameters, everything from nitrogen to organic matter, which you've heard a lot about today and yesterday, all the way through to soil moisture. This is a map of the global distribution of soil moisture on our planet. And I can use those environmental properties to determine which bacteria can survive and thrive in each part of the planet, generating a predictive model of what's happening there. So here I've done it for alpha proteobacteria. This is a very common soil organism. It's actually a group of thousands and thousands of species with incredibly important life. So you can see it's distributed across the planet, but I can go one better than that. If I know who's there, I can actually predict what they are able to do, what their potential to support the functions of that environment are. So for example here, I can predict the genetic abundance of genes, such as cellulobiosidase, which are involved in carbon cycling in soils. If I know what the genes are, and I know how they differ across the world, I can go one further. I can actually predict the, their ability, that microbial community's ability, to turn over, to consume, to produce certain key compounds that are relevant for our society and our world. For example, carbon dioxide. So just by understanding and parameterizing, generating data after data, I can start to build a map of how microbes change over the planet and what that could mean for our society in where we can plant, what we can plant, and how we can manage that crop. Because if you understand what's living in the soil and how it's supporting the world, you can better manage that crop more effectively. We can also predict the past. Um, so in another, I, I'm going to sound macabre. I told you about dead bodies. I'm now going to talk about graveyards. Um, we spent a long time trying to figure out what the Great Prairie used to look like. Uh, obviously, it was eradicated due to the rise of agriculture and nitrogen fertilization um, in the 19th and 20th century. Some 97, 98% of the great prairie that existed in Illinois is no longer there. But it does exist in small fragments. 
Uh, for example, in Civil War graveyards, uh, where there's been no nitrogen fertilization, no agriculture, we can actually find pockets of the Great Prairie still in existence. And we can find it in old railway sidings from the 19th century. Places where, again, agriculture and industry has not exp expanded to the point where we're using very large quantities of fertilizers, um, uh, uh, synthetic fertilizers, to alter that environment. So we built a map by sneaking into graveyards and, and, uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, railway stations around this prairie range, what used to be the extent of the Great Prairie across the Midwest, and built up a map, just like we did with the, uh, the, uh, the globe. We built up a map of what the microbial community looks like across that environment when it's paired with the kinds of prairie plants which are relevant for its health. And we were able to do that in a way that enabled us to predict what the, which organisms lived there and which organisms were abundant, um, and also what their functional abilities were. So this is hindcasting. This is what the prairie ecosystem would have looked like across America from the perspective of the below-ground microbial world in the 1850s. And you can see um, hot or red um, is very diverse areas, areas where there's lots of microbial diversity, and subsequently, um, lots of functional diversity. Those organisms are capable of doing lots of different things. And in the middle, where it's blue, these are areas where there's very low diversity. Only one or two really abundant types of bacteria living there in the center of the prairie range, where the prairie grasses were at the most dense and most important. And subsequently, if you've only got one or two species of bacteria, you've got much lower functional diversity. What, this, what we found from this was quite interesting. What organism was living in the middle of the prairie range? What microbe was really important in that environment? And how was it shaping the ecosystem of that, of that environment? We found that there was a single organism, Veruco microbia, which was incredibly hard to grow in the lab. We knew nothing about it but it was immensely important to the plant. In fact, if you take big blue stem and you try and grow it without this Veruco microbia, it does really badly. Um, much the same as when Ray was talking about ecosystem stability and um, pairing animals with plants, and, and when Claire was pointing out about putting more information, putting more of the animals into the environment. Plants are dependent upon the microbes that live in the soil and live in them. And what we find is that big blue stem cannot survive fluctuations of cold and struggles with fluctuations of drought without the presence of this organism. And this organism is nearly entirely dependent upon big blue stem. But if we take those soils and we add a lot of nitrogen to them, as you would do if you're adding a lot of uh, fertilizers into the soil to promote the growth of crops, it completely eradicates the bacteria. The it cannot survive. It hates to survive when there's lots of nitrogen. It's just not competitive. It's like a panda. A panda eats only one type of plant, right? The panda eats, uh, what does the panda eat? Bamboo. Yeah. If you wipe out the bamboo, no more panda, right? If you wipe out the right kind of organic carbon that this microbe likes, no Veruca microbia. No, Veruca microbia, really unhealthy grasslands. And that's fundamental. This is a wild grass, but there's lots of bioenergy companies that are interested in growing it, and they want to know what microbes should they add back in to help this plant become healthier, more well, more robust, more st stable, more resilient. And this is a really important organism. We're actually able to take all the genetic information from this data and reconstruct what that organism looked like. We can't grow it in a lab. It won't grow without big blue stem. It's like a perfect partnership, evolved over probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. But we found this organism, we called it Eudea bactacopius. Eudea bacta means of the earth, um, and uh, bacta means rod or staff. Um, copious, because it's found everywhere, right? Really obvious. We like to name our microbes after things which make sense. Um, and we looked in Table Mountain in South Africa. We looked across the prairies of North America. We looked in grasslands um, throughout the world. Uh, we even looked in Central Park 
in areas of Central Park that have been put over to grassland wild grass growing, wild, um, wild prairie grass growing, um, with no nitrogen fertilization for the last 120 years since Olmsted put it in place. And in all of those environments, that partnership was intact. It was there, and those, those plants were robust and healthy and resilient and showing immense productivity. This organism is universally almost distributed across the planet. We find it in the uh, Tibetan steppes. We find it in Mongolia. We find it in the uh, prairie grasslands in Iran and Iraq. This is an organism and a partnership with prairie grasses which has survived and thrived across the planet, making those grasses immensely resilient. That partnership is evolved under huge selective pressures and is incredibly important. And what we need to do as scientists, as growers, is to try and figure out what is the perfect microbial relationship like this one for our crops. What can we partner with our crops to make them more resilient? That will be the future of agriculture. The future is difficult to predict, though. Um, we can take our models and we can spin them out into infinity if we want. And every year that we try and predict further, they get worse and worse and worse. Because as anyone who's ever read a weather chart knows, uh, you know, 10 days out, it ain't looking so like, probable that that weather is going to happen. As my wife was telling me, because I'm supposed to go camping this weekend and apparently there's thunderstorms. Um, that's an important understanding. Our models are not perfect. They're only based on what information we have available to us now. But what is interesting is we can predict what the probability or the possibility is of change. So here I've got what's happening on the Earth in terms of microbial carbon cycling in 2018. And I can put that environmental model under different pressures. I could put it under a worst case scenario for an increase in uh, global temperatures. Uh, if everything just keeps on going the way it is, we're going to see a rise of about four degrees. And this is what the microbial system will look like in terms of its ability to turn over carbon. If, um, if we get a, um, a best case scenario, you know, things don't go as fast as we think they're going to do. And we're only going to get about a 1.2 to 1.5 degree centigrade increase. Then we'll have a change that looks something like this. Blue is the production of carbon dioxide by those bacteria. And red is the consumption of carbon dioxide. The, the capturing of that carbon dioxide, making it into protein, into organic matter, which is then sequestered from the atmosphere. And the difference is, um, is uh, yellow. These areas, under, an inc under a worst case scenario, that are highlighted in yellow, will have a massive increase in microbially mediated carbon release. And you see, if you look at North America as it comes by, a lot of those are up in the north, up in the permafrost. And when that environment melts, all hell breaks loose. Lots of organic carbon trapped in frozen matter. And when the microbes, when that all, all that ice freezes or melts and you've got a lot of water, the microbes will go crazy. They'll consume it. It all goes into the atmosphere. And we need to be able to understand, predict, and figure out what impact that could have upon the globe and upon local regional climate. And we've done that for North America here. If climate stabilized today, if nothing changed, right, if everything stayed the same for the next 30 to 40 years, if there was no global warming, if there was no increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, if everything was normal, we would still see a dramatic change in the microbial diversity of North America. And we see areas in red here are areas where you're going to get a big increase in microbial diversity, all in the north and interestingly in the subtropics. In the center, it's very patchy. A vast majority of North America is going to see an explosion of microbial diversity. Is that a good thing? We've talked about biodiversity and how important it is. Well, I would argue that if you're Eudea back to Copius, if you're that Veruco microbia, that panda that lives with your one food source, then that's not a good thing. This suggests ecosystem instability. These ecosystems are now not stable. They are undergoing dramatic change in the next 30 to 40 years. And that creates unpredictability. I've worked for industry um, in various capacities, such as making ice cream taste smoother, uh, for many years. So one thing industry and business and farmers hate 
is an unpredictability. Growers don't have a choice, and so you live with that on a day-by-day, year-by-year basis. You have good years, you have bad years. Companies hate it. There's a real importance to enabling people to predict what's going to happen and producing the best predictions possible to enable that to be a reality. We've even gone into China to look at how microbes associate with other microbes to understand that ecosystem, see if we can predict stability, what makes an ecosystem more resilient. In this environment, we looked across the entire eastern coast of China from very wet regions in the south, where there's lots of temperature and moisture, to lots of dry regions in the north where there isn't very much moisture. And we found really unique associations. We looked at bacteria, we looked at fungi, and we looked at something which has not been mentioned at all this entire conference, which are the archaea. Archaea are the things which produce methane. Bacteria can't produce methane, archaea do. And archaea and bacteria under the microscope look identical. But they're a completely different form of life. They're as alien to bacteria as we are to bacteria. And they perform incredible, complex relationships in the world. So we looked at those, bacteria, archaea, and fungi, all across this environment, in forests and grasslands across this ecosystem. And when we associated which ones liked living with which other ones. So the red dots here are bacterial species. The green dots are uh, protists and, the, and fungi. And the blue dots are the archaea. And we found almost 60,000 associations between the bacteria and the fungi and the archaea, um, 90% of which were universally distributed across the whole of China, no matter which environment you went into. The tropical zone, the northern temperate zone, it didn't matter. They were, those relationships were very strong and very stable. 10% of them were found only in one particular climactic zone. And that was really important to us, because if you want stability, you want relationships which can survive when you throw them into different types of environment, when you make the temperature vary, when you make the moisture content vary. Those relationships are immensely important. And we can predict what factors actually affect those relationships. So here, I've actually graded the east coast of China based on whether the microbes have fewer um, but very strong relationships um, or maybe more but weaker relationships. You can liken that to your age, right? You know, now I have a one very strong uh, romantic relationship. Maybe when I was younger, I uh, didn't have so many uh, strong relationships but lots of weaker relationships. But, uh, you know, maybe I was slightly more promiscuous. That's the South, right? You can say that about the um, English South and the American South and South of China. Um, I know I'm stepping on really dangerous territory now. No, just ignore me. Nothing I said. Nothing, nothing going on here. <laughs> that relationship is incredibly important, right? Up in the north, you have microbes which are uniquely dependent upon each other because there's not much moisture around, so they become very dependent upon who they can interact with. In the south, you have microbes that have lots of moisture around, and they can send their metabolites out and their chemicals and feeding products to lots of different organisms around them making them a lot more stable, a lot more able to survive change because they're not so reliant. They're not the panda with the bamboo, which is living in the north. They're, the, they're a, a microbe which is adaptable, like the rat. It can, it can adapt and it can change and it can alter, like humans, right? And finding out which of those organisms could be harnessed and used for biotechnological applications in agriculture is absolutely key. How can we figure out which of those really promiscuous or really strong relationships and harness those and tie them into creating more resilient crop structures. And we've been doing that with groups out in South Sahara in Africa. So in this one particular study, working with some low input, small holding groups, uh, where very small farms, mostly run by women, 95% of them are run by women. Um, they do support 900 million of the world's people, uh, but they're very small environments. And we looked at the impact of fertilizer, nitrogen addition, but also legume rotations and organic matter introductions into the soil. Just adding nitrogen fertilizer reduced the microbial diversity of the soil, but it also broke apart the strong and uh, some of these copiously uh, promiscuous relationships, damaging that connectivity, making a single organism that just feeds off of the nitrogen crack that you're adding into the soil, right, and just, just outcompetes everything. Those relationships get eroded, they get damaged, and the crops don't do so well. 
So we can, we can go into these kind of environments and figure out what is the best strategy. Adding organic materials to this soil is absolutely essential. Adding rotations in to increase diversity is absolutely essential. Legumes, for example, add nitrogen into the soil by bacteria. The only thing that can fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere, because 80% of it in the air you're breathing right now, are bacteria. Beautiful relationship. And humans. From about 100 years ago, we figured out how to do that, right? Um, but bacteria do it better, more effectively, and more efficiently. So we, we, we have a, owe a lot to them in trying to figure out how to add that nitrogen from the natural environment, from the microbes, back into the soil. Which brings me to humans. Um, most people I know don't really care about the soil or the people. Um, they care about themselves. They care about their health. They care about who they are and their loved ones. And that's incredibly important. I know I do. <laughs> um, I just so happen to be fascinated as well by things that go on outside of my health and uh, the health of my family. But you have a microbial ecosystem inside you. Each one of you has 40 trillion bacteria living in your intestine. That's half a pound to a pound of your body mass. You weigh up a pound of sugar in your hand, and so many bacteria are living inside your body. And the, they are fundamentally important for your health. Without them, you can't digest your food. Without them, your immune system goes completely skew if. Without them, your brains don't develop properly. Without them, you can't actually regulate the amount of sugar in your bloodstream. They are fundamentally important, and they can shape your life in many, many unique ways. And just like if I took a tree away from an environment, like the Amazon rainforest, and I stripped it out, it would have effects upon the hydrology of that ecosystem, upon climate in that ecosystem. Just the same as uh, taking a plant or a tree out of that environment, if I take bacteria, certain types, out of your bodies, your ecosystem will be affected. Everything is connected. We've heard that refrain a number of times. Ecology is the study of connections, and everything is connected to each other. And that's why we're starting to see significant bodies of evidence supporting the fact that there are associations between a disruption in your microbial ecosystem and disease states. Everything from cancer and inflammatory bowel disease all the way down to dental caries and diabetes. The relationship between your body and your microbial ecosystem is fundamental to your health. Hence the reason you have an ecologist working as a professor of surgery. Makes no bloody sense. But if you think about the body as an ecosystem, it starts to make perfect sense. I'm employing ecological medicine, which is a form of holistic medicine. It's a form of exploring the body as a whole environment. And that involves actually looking at how that environment interacts with the world around it. Short lesson about microbes. Microbes are little chemical factories. They're the best chemical factories on Earth. They are highly diverse, they are highly complex, and they're very efficient. And they produce lots of things, so bacteria can actually produce amino acids. And we work with um, uh, children suffering from malnutrition um, in Africa and in, uh, uh, in uh, 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 the Caribbean. And we are actually examining those children and whether their microbes might be helping to manage them, make them more resilient to malnutrition. And we found that bacteria in the guts of some of these children are producing excess amino acids, which actually help to provide them with more protein when they're not getting enough protein. The body finds a way to adapt to selective pressure. And the microbes in the body might be helping support these children. Children that get malnourished have a big impact upon neurodevelopment. You can have a 10 to 20% reduction in your ability to perform well in school if you are malnourished for a period of three to four weeks under the age of one. That's huge, right? That can affect a lot about your life, your prosperity, your social interactions. It can lead to feelings of worthlessness. It can lead to depression and anxiety. It can disrupt your ability to make money later in life and get a job. It can turn you to crime. Think about the social ills in your environment and then think about how many of them could be linked to events that happen early in childhood that are physiological but could be affecting how your brain functions and develops. We know that microbes also can break down some of the drugs you consume. If you take acetaminophen, microbes can make it into acetaminophen sulfate. If you have the wrong kind of bacteria living in your gut and you're taking a lot of um, acetaminophen, a lot of Advil, 
Now that feels ibuprofen. Uh, what's the acetaminophen? Tylenol. Look, I love Americans. You guys know your pharmacy better than anyone on earth. Um, <laughs> English people are like, eh. Um, they break it down. That acetaminophen sulfate's toxic to your liver. So if you have to take Tylenol chronically to cure pain, then uh, you might want to have a microbial screen beforehand, right? Figure out if you've got the wrong kind of bacteria. They also break down your bile acids. So your gut produces bile acids into your intestine to help break down food. Microbes feed off of those bile acids as well. It's their food as well. And they break secondary bile acids, secondary compounds, some of which are essential for actually making sure your body stays healthy, for fighting off diseases. Your body cannot be uh, uh, C. difficile, for example. Clostridium difficile, a major infective agent, C. diff causes people's lives to be horrible, bloody diarrhea, chronic in infections, um, death. It, it can't actually colonize your body if your microbes are producing enough of these secondary bile acids. Incredibly important, right? And the important thing about this is those microbes and their chemical factories touch everything. Everything touches everything. It's not cause and effect immediately. It's cause and effect, 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 effect. Ripples in a pool. If you change one thing, you change or have the consequence to change lots of things. And ecology is just like that. Everything's connected. Um, microbes can affect your life in fun ways. Uh, mosquitoes, my wife says I'm, I'm highly susceptible to being bitten by mosquitoes, and uh, she'll walk with me um, as her own mosquito repellent because they'll all come to me and bite me, and they'll leave her alone. That's uh, not entirely true, but it is true that microbes on your skin break down your sweat, releasing... Um, flavorful molecules into the air, which are actually attracting and causing mosquitoes to want to bite. And I can actually take the bacteria from your wrist and transfer them to your ankle and actually make mosquitoes that would normally bite your wrist now bite your ankle. Different species of mosquitoes can bite different areas, and microbes tell them where to bite. Very important if you're a warfighter in a hot zone and you don't want to get a local infection to figure out how to interrupt that relationship. Also important for the millions of people that die a year of insect-borne diseases. That is a picture of two flies humping. Um, it's also the name of my new album. Dave and I are going to record it next, next month. <laughs> Microbes can affect behavior. They can have an effect upon brain development, yes, but also immediate behavior. Anyone that's ever felt hungry or hangry or whatever you call it probably knows that. Bacteria in the intestine of these animals uh, can influence how their brain develops and functions. We know that if I take the microbiome from one fruit fly and I transplant it into the gut of another fruit fly, what we call a fecal microbiome transplant, taking the poop from one animal and putting it into another, I can actually make that second fruit fly fancy the fly that the first fruit fly fancied. <gasps> I'm great at tongue twisters. But that's amazing, right? You think that should be, a, that should be like an evolved behavior? It's not. That's a behavior that can be altered by the chemical presence of these organisms inside the guts of these animals. The same is probably true for a lot of other higher organisms. We know it's true for mice and pigs and rats, maybe humans. Maybe you were so attracted to your mate based on some kind of microbial intervention. Who knows, right? We don't know. That's uh, it's very important. I do not know if that's true. But <laughs> it, it could be interesting to find out. Um, what do I think has been happening in the world? Well, we used to play outside and live outside and work outside a lot where we were exposed to lots of microbial life. Now we spend most of our time indoors where we're not exposed to very much. And um, we think that the way we kill all life in the environment, good and bad organisms, might actually be reducing our microbial exposure. And if our immune systems aren't seeing lots of microbes, it can affect how the immune system develops, maybe making us more allergic to the world. We think that by adding some microbes back into the experience of children especially, we might actually be able to protect them from the development of allergies and, if, and those kind of diseases. And if anyone 30 years ago, does anyone remember one of their friends having a peanut butter allergy in school? How many parents here uh, have one of their kids have a peanut butter allergy in school now? Uh, one, two, no, two, three, three? Gee, that's not true. Right? Maybe, maybe not in Minnesota. I mean, this is the wrong state, right? Everyone's like, eh, everyone's fine here. <laughs> in Illinois, it's rampant. <laughs> My kids got like 10 of them. Um, it's incredibly important. There's, a, there's been a significant rise in food allergies, a significant rise in skin allergies, in eczema in a population. 
And we think it may be due to this trigger. Asthma is another one. Um, we work with the Amish and Hutterite uh, peoples uh, um, in uh, Indiana and Dakota, um, trying to identify if there are relationships between why some of them don't have the same kind of disease burden as others. The Amish and the Hutterites both come from Eastern Europe a couple of thousand years ago. Uh, in around the 12th, 14th century, they moved to Central and Northern Europe. And in the 19th century, they moved over to North America to escape religious persecution. The Amish set up shop between Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana. The Hutterites live in the Dakotas. And they live a very, very similar lifestyle. They both uh, have given up technology. They, they like the plow. That's about it, right? Um, we now know the plow's bad. They should give that up too. What would they have left? Um, <laughs> but the, they, they, uh, they don't like technology. I can take my children to one of these farms to show them that a child can survive without an iPad for more than 10 minutes. It's physically possible, right? Technology isn't important. Um, they both eat incredibly healthily. They both eat lots of past unpasteurized milk, unpasteurized cheese, lots of fermented foods. Um, they, they eat a good, healthy farm lifestyle, right? And there's one fundamental difference between these two populations. The Amish live on their family farm. The front door is 50 feet from the barn door. The kids work on the farm before and after school. There's a fundamental relationship with the farming environment from birth. The Hutterite kids do not. The men get in a buggy in the morning, they drive out to an off-site farm, which is quite industrialized, where they work, and in the evening, they change back into their home clothes, get back in the buggy, come home. It's a very it's a unique separation of the kids from the farm in the Hutterite community. The Amish have about 4% asthma in their population. The Hutterites have 25%. Compared to the US national average of 7%, that means a significant increase in asthma rates in that population. And the only thing we can find that appears to be related to it is the separation of the children from the farm. So a little bit of immunology, how does that work? Well, you have these things running around inside your body and your immune system called neutrophils. Um, neutrophils are like the scouts um, at the head of the army. They go around looking for foreign objects, looking for dust, looking for bacteria, looking for viruses. And when they find one, they latch onto it, send out this immense signal, and the whole immune system comes cascading down, killing the neutrophil, but also getting rid of the problem particle. That's how your immune system works, right? What happens is uh, we look at the population of neutrophils on the left there. The Amish have a lot more neutrophils than the Hutterites and in the kid's blood. We think this is because the Amish are being exposed to more particles, more bacteria, more viruses, more dirt, right? They are being bombarded by it because of their lifestyle and their work environment, and that increases the number of neutrophils their body needs. In fact, the Hutterites have more eosinophils, and eosinophils are like the really angry pro-inflammatory cells in the immune system. When you have an eosinophil reaction, you've got a massive amount of inflammation, and inflammation can lead to an asthmatic attack. And the Hutterite kids have a lot more of those. But the most exciting thing for me is that these cell surface markers on neutrophils, we call them CXCR4 and CD11B, and there will be a test afterwards, so please remember that. Um, they are massively elevated in the Hutterites. These are just little proteins living on the outside of the neutrophil cell. And the Hutterites have lots more of them. What does that mean? That means those neutrophils have been hanging around in circulation, waiting to find something and not finding anything living in the uh, Hutterite children's blood, and they become old. They die naturally about four days old, right? It's a very short life. But if by two days they haven't started to see anything, they start to send out all these secretory proteins, and that makes them stick together. The neutrophils become sticky, and then they stick together and stick together and stick together and stick together until they form these big ball of neutrophils. And when that big ball finally sees a foreign particle, they send out an enormous chemical response and go, oh my god! And then the immune system comes down with the wrath of some angel and wipes out everything, causing a massive burst of eosinophils and massive inflammation. So if you don't use your neutrophils, they get old and sticky, you're gonna have a significant inflammatory response, and that's a major issue. We, to prove this, we took animals, uh, mice, and we exposed those mice. We made the mice allergic to a certain type of dietary protein. And I know some people in the audience won't be happy with that, but I tried to do it on the children, and they didn't allow me to do it. Um, 
If you can find me someone that will allow me to do human experimentation, I'm happy to, but uh, let, let it be known we cured the mice, so they're fine. We take the mice and we expose them to dust from the Amish children's bedrooms, and it actually stopped them from being allergic to the thing we made them allergic to. So we could give them as much of that dietary protein as we wanted to, and they didn't have an allergic reaction. And you can see that the, uh, these are sonophils here on the left, those are those really pro-inflammatory cells. The blue are animals that are allergic. We've, we've blown dust from the Amish kids' bedrooms into their noses, and they have a massive reduction in their sonophil relationship. No inflammation, no overreaction, and they're healthy. So, of course, just bottle up the dust on Amish farms and sell it in CVS or wherever, and everything will be fine, right? Um, not so easy as that. We've got to figure out what it is. It's going to take us a little while to do it. We've got to package it up. It has to be regulated, because if it's not, then I could be selling you anything. I could be a snake oil salesman saying, hey, this dust, this dust is the best dust. Take this dust, $50 a bottle. It's going to be amazing, all right? There's a reason we have a federal drug administration, Food and Drug Administration. If we don't have that federal agency keeping control of um, dodgy entrepreneurs like me who want to sell you dust from any old farm, you're going to have a problem. And unless all the farmers in the room can open up your farms to thousands of inner city children so they can come and spend every weekend there um, and get that kind of dust exposure, then we're going to have major problems. Soil bacteria could also improve anxiety. So one more, one more nice anecdote, right? Um, what we've done, we found a bacteria called Mycobacterium vaccae, which is found in soils. And when we give that bacteria to mice, they become a lot less stressed. How do we know if a mouse is stressed? We use this thing called an open arm test, where we put a mouse on stage, right? And if the mouse hides, it goes behind here, it's actually pretty stressed, which is what the mice should do, right? In the, in the wild, the mouse should stay hidden, because if it doesn't stay hidden, it's going to get eaten. But it shows anxiety about the world around it. If I give that mouse Mycobacterium vaccae, the mouse is no longer anxious. It significantly reduces its anxiety levels, Hormone levels for anxiety go down. The neurochemistry inside the brain significantly alters to a more relaxed state. And we have a hypothesized, but there's plenty of evidence for very similar physiological traits in people who garden regularly. Um, so if you garden regularly, um, you can actually reduce your stress levels. And we think it's potentially because of the immune stimulation of organisms like Mycobacterium vaccae having an effect upon how your physiology works. So there's an, there's an explanation why you feel better when you've spent a little bit of time outside. Just very quickly, I'm not sure I'm running out of time, probably. Um, we, uh, we've done a lot of work indoors and environments, and this, this ecosystem that you're sitting in right now is just another ecosystem. We just built it. And every single one of you right now is emitting into your immediate vicinity 38 million bacterial cells every hour. And those in the front row are getting a lot of my oral microbiome. I apologize for that. Um, you can't stop that from happening. It just happens. If you go into the bathroom and you don't want to touch the door handle and you pull down your cuff and you're like, oh, you know, from there, I don't want to touch it because there's achy things on there. Trust me, the bacteria are going through this. This is like loose fishnet stockings to bacteria. <laughs> They're very, very, very small. It's like trying to put toilet paper on a toilet seat and expecting bacteria not to come through it. Just give up the trouble, you're not helping anyone. Um, <laughs> that environment's really important to us because we live inside it now. Unless you do live on a farm, unless you work outside, the majority of us have to live in this environment for 90% of our lives, especially if you live in an urban ecosystem. So we've been examining that. We actually mapped and modeled the movement of bacteria between people. So this is four people, their feet, their hands, their noses, living inside a home. And we mapped and modeled how the microbes move between them Sometimes hands move, bacteria move between hands and noses quite a lot, and floors and surfaces in the home. And then we saw what happened when you added animals into that. Ray propounded putting animals into agriculture. I, put, I say, put animals into the home. If you put dogs, for example, into your home, you significantly increase the distribution and movement of microbes in the home environment, significantly increase the microbial diversity in a good way, and you can have profound effects upon your child's health. A child that is allowed to physically interact with a dog under the age of one years old will have a 13% reduction in the likelihood of developing asthma, which is highly significant. 
Virtually no other remedy has a, as big an effect, but they have to physically interact with the dog. In fact, couples that have a dog in their home share more bacteria and a greater happiness than couples without a dog. In fact, couples with a baby share less bacteria than couples with a dog. <laughs> so if you think sharing bacteria might be important for your relationship, then rescue a dog. Don't get a baby. It's not going to save your marriage. It's so very important. <laughs> My wife took that to heart in a big way and rescued Captain Bo Digley here, who's uh, been our little companion for the last five years. I know, I know uh, Dave uh, Montgomery and I feel very similar about dogs. And we have a long history with them. They're incredibly important to um, our populations. Uh, but they may not be the only solution. People from different parts of the world don't have an ancestral relationship with dogs. They have an ancestral relationship with other types of animals. So we have to understand that. We have to look at ethnic diversity, regional diversity, and figure out what are the most appropriate strategies for doing that. And very, very quickly, I want to make a call out to two components which I think could have an impact, because I don't think we've discussed practical applications enough. Call out to, um, I saw this booth yesterday in one of the displays, the Citizen Science um, a lobby who are working to do a bipartisan program for looking at a, um, a carbon tax. I think that's one way of doing it. I think it's difficult. I think the government works incredibly slowly, but I, don't, I think without that kind of engagement, we're never going to make any progress. My other one is entrepreneurship. I think that, you, that's you from the company, right? <laughs> entrepreneurship, I think, is another one, and I'll make a big push for that. I come from industry, but I'm an academic. Um, I'm a libertarian, but I'm more fiscally conservative, but I, you know, I'm of liberal values. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, if you find a thing that works and you can sell it to people, they will buy it and people will invest in it and the science will get better and the world will change much faster. In fact, Pivot Bio, this new company that's come out, just garnered $70 million uh, over the last week from um, a new venture firm, Breakthrough Energy, which is... Um, basically financially backed by Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, Michael Bloomberg, and Richard Branson. They see that the only way to make rapid change is to invest in commercial applications that could have an effect. All of these companies, Pivot, Azotic, Intrinsic Bio, are trying to take bacteria which capture the nitrogen out of the atmosphere and package them with seeds to allow those seeds to actually actively get their nitrate from the environment in the natural way so as to allow that environment to be more, that crop to be more energetically sustainable and to reduce the need for nitrate fertilizers uh, and therefore the cost of those fertilizers. That to me is a rapid way of accelerating the potential of reducing uh, soil damage and improving soil health. Uh, and I, I have a book. Uh, the book's fun. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.